Hello, I'm Don Morse, and welcome to Montgomery Week in Review. The county PTA organization has been in the news recently, both good and unfortunately bad. Jane Dewin, who comments for this program, is a former president of the Montgomery County Council of PTAs, will tell us about what the organization does and, and why we should be happy that it's around. Scams are dangerous to all groups, but often elderly people are particularly at risk. Jessica Hall, a prosecutor in the state's attorney's office who handles scam cases against the elderly, will tell us about what all of us should be aware as we try to help our elderly population. Recently, there have been two well-attended environmental marches in Washington, D.C., and are held also around the world. Josh Kurtz from Nature Conservancy is here. He's going to talk about this, and also he's going to discuss some of the things that happened during the session in Annapolis regarding critical legislation about the environment that actually passed the General Assembly. As always, the Beacon has interesting and useful stories about our health and how we can improve our health. Stuart Rosenthal, editor and publisher of the Beacon newspaper, has these stories and others from the May issue, and I think as we always see, it's not just the older population that benefits from these, it's all of us. Thank you, Stuart. So, Jane, welcome back. Thank you. The Montgomery County Council of PTAs. Yes. It's a mouthful. Yes, it is. And so people, MCC PTA. So we, I, you know, we're all familiar with, the, you know, we all went to school, or PTAs, Parent Teacher Association. But this, this council, is, it's, it's, the, it's the PTA of the PTAs, right? Exactly. It is all, um, it's kind of like a, a bridge between the state PTA and the local PTAs and the local PTAs each pay uh, a certain amount of dues, I think it's a dollar per person that okay. funds the council. And the council does uh, a lot of training on, you know, like how should you run your own local PTA, they do training okay. on like how to be a president. But the main focus in Montgomery County at least is as an advocacy organization. But you've got oh. so much diverse background of these parents and, mm -hmm. you know, some are more active, some are less. How does, how does the PTA, how does the Council of PTAs work to try to like, you know, speak with one voice? Right. Well, it can be difficult because there really are, you're trying to represent uh, the whole county's worth and really the PTA is supposed to be representing not the parents' voice but what is best for the kids. So that's where you have to keep, you know, digging down in the layers to get that. But every PTA mm -hmm. sends two delegates to the county council meetings that are um, once a month and right. they take positions and they take them back to their locals to get, uh, you know, to get kind of some guidance on how the delegates should vote. Uh, and so really if there's a position that it's, it's yeah. there's a foundation for it. How do you find out what's important to the kids, what their needs are. Do you have them represented as well in some way? Uh, not, well actually, three years ago there was a student who was one of the officers of the local PTA um, for, in Montgomery County, middle schools and high schools are actually PTSAs, right. which students can join, mm -hmm. um, and their locals are, but I think it's really, I mean, for the most part, it is really, you know, trying to dig down and, and to figure out what. Before we get know, to other questions, let's get best. to that, this dark thing that's been mm -hmm. in the news. This, uh, there was right. a alleged embezzlement of monies. Right, um, uh, for many technically people. financial irregularities. So, so I mean, this is this is many, for many people. It's the first time that they knew about the organization. Right. It's been working on their behalf in the, in right. the background. What what happened? What can you tell us about it? Right. Well, <clears throat> there was some a new president started last summer, and when he came in, the new treasurer informed him that okay, um, you know, our annual dinner lost money, things are tight, etc. So he he kind of went through the year telling people that, okay, we don't have much money, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it reached a point that, okay, there's, they had an audit through last summer and it came out okay. So people started saying, okay, if we really, you, you know, we really need to know because I don't, there are no signs or, mm -hmm. okay. you know, there's no reason for that. So they, they put together an audit committee just of volunteers who looked into it. And within, you know, three days of this committee getting together, and looking at the real bank statements, it was very clear that things 
we're well, hoping yes. that money is going to be found. It's under a rock. It's uh, right. Well, it's, where... we don't know where it is. I mean, there has been one person who has resigned from the county PTA, and unfortunately, this person was also the treasurer of her local elementary school and middle school PTA. So that has widened things. But everything has been turned over to the police and the state's attorney's office. So I think it's to be to be continued. And one of the things that I've thinking about is, is where's is education headed in the county? Where, what's your, where, where are we? We've got about a minute and a half left. Uh, um, not a lot of time to talk about education. I know a lot of questions. Yeah. Well, I think that people are, very, are, are pretty happy with the superintendent and the direction that he's taking and is really, you know, the achievement gap, et cetera, is, can, you know, has been something that we've been talking about for, you know, two decades. Um, but he's got some interesting new approaches to it that really kind of highlight some things outside of school, tying some other things in. Does he so. work well with the PTA? Are you, are you having influence in kind of how those, those are being shaped, those policies? Yeah, I, I think that it does. Um, since actually I was president, the Montgomery County Council of PTAs is represented in the entire budget development process, um, which is a very long process each year and gets to have some you know, gets to put in their two cents about, you know, okay, yeah, we'd like to see this expanded or, you know, if we have to find some savings, you know, this is okay or this is no, this would be harmful. Um, and the county PTA does a lot in terms of commenting on Board of Education policies. Are we doing enough in science education, do you think? Um, I mean, no. I think of that is with our uh, science. No, but you can come to my organization, Big Learning, and take take our after school enrichment programs in science and engineering. But no, I mean there are definitely movements within the school system to do more STEM oriented things. But um, I think there's room for a lot more. Challenge. We got about twenty seconds. What's the biggest challenge right now? Education in Montgomery County. Um, I think really being able to address the needs of all children that, that for some kids that are really big and are outside of just, okay. you know, you, they come with a lot of needs. All right. We'll talk more about special needs as we move ahead in the coming months. Thanks, okay. Jane. Yeah. So we go from the youngest to concern about some of the oldest in our community. Jessica, welcome. Thank so you, Don. Your first time on the show. It is. Uh, please give our regards to uh, John McCarthy, one of our favorite folks, our state's attorney who you you work for. That's um, correct. Tell us a little bit about what uh, the state's attorney's office is doing to help protect individuals, our elderly, against scams, and, and a little bit about what the scope of the of the problem is. Well, thanks, Don. Um, so specifically, the state's attorney's office does believe that the best way to protect the uh, citizens in our community from elderly scams is through education. And so we want to reach out to the community and sort of educate them as to the type of scams that people are trying to perpetrate on the elderly community. And I want to talk a little bit about, um, we hear a lot in the media, I think, about telephone scams, right. about internet scams. Um, but one thing this time of year that I think is particularly relevant to elderly citizens in our community is uh, something we call the woodchuck scam. And uh, woodchuck, what is the woodchuck scam? Yes. Yeah, so I see you're smiling at the name woodchuck, but uh, no, I, wood I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm cringing inside of what okay. it might be. The, well, the woodchuck, <laughs> the woodchuck scam is sort of a home improvement scam, and what this is is uh, individuals posing as valid, respectable contractors who come out and ring your doorbell normally after a big weather event. Um, and they purport to notice some deficiency with um, your driveway. You either need some new, um, you need some new concrete on your driveway, or oftentimes they pose as being tree trimmers, and they want to trim uh, your trees for you for a fair price. And the way this scam is perpetrated um, is that uh, these scammers uh, get up in the tree. They get into your house, they all of a sudden want to check your attic for insulation, they want to check your roof for leaks, uh, they want to check your foundation for cracks, and most recently we had investigated and prosecuted a group of scammers who um, purported to be a family working together who scammed an elderly woman suffering from severe dementia of close to $100,000. Uh, so these are scams that could be for, you know, five hundred, one thousand dollars, or these are scams that could go on and on um, for months. Yes, Jessica, are these people who come into the house and then steal things in the house, or do they just charge them money for things they haven't really done? Uh, absolutely not. They do not steal from inside the house. Generally, they um, 
claim that they're performing work in areas that are hard to access, such as the attic, the roof, um, the foundation sometimes, uh, and they just overcharge for yeah. work that's poorly performed or they charge for work that was never performed at all. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, it's probably likely that there was nothing wrong in the first place. Is that they, like, so they're inventing problems? That's exactly right, yes. Mm -hmm. Often they start with a legitimate problem, such as we've had this big storm, let's clean up this mm -hmm. tree. Um, but then that quickly becomes, well, there's this fictitious problem. I'm going to take, uh, sometimes they take one of those caulk guns and they go up into your attic right. and the caulk gun's full of water. They spray your insulation, they bring you up. Look, it's wet, it's because of uh, the leak in the roof. We need to replace your whole roof. So, you know, I live in a neighborhood that's mixed of, of younger people and middle-aged people, but a lot of elderly folks as well. How can I, I mean, what, what can we do as a community? What can we do as a neighborhood? Because there's only so much education that you can do from, from the offices in Rockville and getting out, even if you're in locality. You can't go from home to home. That's right. Though you seem very energetic. I don't know if you have, <laughs> anybody has that much energy. Unless you're running for office, of course. <laughs> but, um, um, but how do we, what, what do we do to help our neighbors? Well, the most important thing, and a lot of these scams do get reported to our office or to the police department from concerned neighbors. So if you do have elderly neighbors who are um, uh, wheelchair bound or just elderly neighbors in general who have difficulty getting up to these places, um, be, I guess, uh, sensitive as to who's coming and going from their home. Uh, be willing to kind of ask them, like, what's going on? Maybe you should get a second opinion about this work before you pay. Uh, this individual to do it. Um, you should also suggest to your neighbors um, if they're elderly or really anyone it's the best practice to check someone's license. If they're doing tree work they technically have to have a license to do that and if they don't that's a problem. Um, if they're doing home improvement work you're supposed to have a license mm -hmm. for that as well. You know as you're talking about this it's really depressing to me because there's no way that you're working yourself out of a job. <laughs> I mean this is one the wood check Chuck and then we've got the fishing expeditions mm -hmm. online we got those wonderful calls from the fake benevolent entities of police Microsoft. or fire oh, or yeah. whatever. We've got Google Docs or Google videos coming in. There's fishing. There were warnings this morning. I mean, it's it's an onslaught on on our most vulnerable who who also often have access to money. Absolutely. And one of the other scams that we've heard about, about 40 um, seconds left. one of the other scams that we've heard about most recently that I think the elderly are particularly sensitive to are telephone scams involving they call them sort of the kidnapping grandma scam. So you get a call from somebody claiming that your loved one, your grandson, your granddaughter has been kidnapped. And then there's, a, I guess, a, another person in the background screaming and yelling, trying to create this sense of urgency um, to have you wire some money so that this loved one can get out of trouble. So these are the types of scams that really they create a sense of urgency in the victim. And that's how they're susceptible to these scams. We've got a end right now and, and go to some messages but I hope you'll come back with a story next time you're back that we've we've like wiped one of these scams out. Mm -hmm. We'll be right back after these messages. here Josh Gertz. Thanks Don. I really appreciate excited. that you're here. Uh, it's good to be back yeah, after this break and where we can focus on Nature Conservancy but really we've had these two unbelievably marches, unbelievable marches in around the world that really focused on DC. Why don't you take us through those two marches? Absolutely, absolutely. I'll start with the Science March. Um, the Nature Conservancy was actually a sponsor of that. Our CEO spoke. I don't know if anybody had a chance to get out there. It was a beautiful day. Oh. Sun was shining. Everybody was having a great time. Sure. Um, not actually, it was really pouring down rain. No, it was rain. pouring down rain. I wish it was pouring down rain. It was cold and yeah. rainy and yucky and, and a lot of people. But I was, gonna, I was going with you in that. It, it was, it was, but I was actually really impressed with how many people stuck around. Um, we had you know, hundreds of thousands of people down there on the mall, some really great programming. And I think it really called attention to the importance of science and policy making. And you know, having it right in front of the White House, you know, I want to thank the Park Service for that. Yeah. They could really hear the, uh, the messages that were coming out of those loudspeakers. And you've got, you know, it, it's, it's like, you know, as, as somebody described it, nerds on parade. Yeah. And because you don't see, I mean, these are a lot of folks who, who don't want to be engaged at all in politics. Science, and this is their life, and, you know, and, and, and mm -hmm. today's events, politics go back and forth, but science continues going. But what's got, what, what had everybody feeling that they had to come out for a, a science march? You know, I think looking at the way the, the policy uh, world is moving at, at the federal level, I think there's a belief that we're not incorporating science as much. 
Um, if you look at maybe the state level or more local, and I'll talk a little bit about the legislative session in Annapolis, we're seeing that use of science, that reliance on the university system and things like that. And I think people are concerned that their voices aren't being heard and that, that you know, science is apolitical. So we'll go from science to climate. Yes. The next week, what was tell us about the climate march? Climate march, better weather. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was uh, another great march. You know, I think we saw all around the world people coming out and standing up for what they believe in. And you know, uh, at the Nature Conservancy, we really believe that we need to stay a part of the Paris Agreement. And I think people came out and demonstrated Paris that. Paris Agreement. What's that? The Paris Agreement is an international agreement to reduce carbon emissions and carbon equivalent emissions. And uh, you know countries, I think there's hundreds of countries that were involved that set goals and targets to reduce their emissions to help the whole globe. And, and, and as I understand it, uh, the, the President, uh, President Trump, has announced, or part of the campaign, was to get us out of the Paris Agreement that, that it wasn't good for the United States domestic policy. Is yes, that correct? yeah, and I, I think the comment was that it would potentially hurt our economy, you know, looking at switching. And he's sources. focused, the President has focused a lot on the coal industry and trying to bring that back, but, you know, what's the likelihood and really has the world, has, has energy generation changed? I mean, is that likely that we're going to have we, acid rain again? I think we're, we've seen a, a large shift in how energy is produced in this country, and it's continuing to evolve, and, and Maryland is actually a leader in that front. Um, we have a renewable portfolio standard that's um, 25% by 2020, which is a rather ambitious goal, but we're striving to get there with, uh, you know, building the renewable economy. And I think that goes to, you know, his point of they want a robust economy, and renewables will be a piece of that moving forward. So, so, can we transition to Maryland? Yes. Because uh, I, I think one of the things that many people don't really, you know, we talk about coal. Uh, you know, I, I've been in coal-fired countries where you're smoking that coal dust and that smoke, and it's not pleasant, and I'm not sure anybody wants that in the future, but good political thing, I guess, if you don't smoke and breathe it in. <laughs> Maryland, tell us about what happened in Maryland. Maryland, uh, great stuff happened this session. We saw several science-based policies get, get moved forward. Um, I'd start with the, the Green Jobs Act, which is part of the Renewable Portfolio Standard, but also built out the About economy. a minute and a half left, so let's get through them. Got it. Uh, the, the next one would be the Clean Water Commerce Act, which is really innovative funding source for pollution reduction in the Bay. Um, we also had the ban on fracking, so protecting uh, water as it comes down out of you know our, our western Maryland piece down to people in Montgomery County who drink the water here. Uh, and then I think you know, those, those are the three largest. We had some smaller ones that incentivized good behavior and gave tax credits to people who are using nature for the benefit of all of us. Does it, I think one of the questions that comes up from those who say that Maryland's gone too far in these things, it makes Maryland uncompetitive. Uh, and as the, against Virginia or Pennsylvania or wherever it did. Tell us about that argument. You know, I, I think there's, a, there's many economic arguments within that, and I think it's rather nuanced. I would counter with the success of our solar um, economy in Maryland. It's one of it's uh, one of the largest growing job sources in the in the state, and it's also uh, at the f uh, the national level. Solar and renewable jobs have surpassed fossil fuels, so I think it is contributing to the economy nationally, but also here in Maryland. It was ironic, wasn't it, when we saw that the the coal uh, museum in Kentucky or West Virginia or whatever um, is is powered by solar. <laughs> um, I mean, I think that was. A, we could go on and on. I wish we could, and I hope you'll come back, Josh. Thanks, Don. We'd love to. Yeah, thank you very much, Stuart. Don, Mr. Cleanup today. Okay. I'm used to you being in one, two, somewhere in the middle, right, right. Yes. But I guess they needed some adult supervision. Okay. Well, <laughs> so thank you, you, thank you. Uh, we have some very How interesting stories in the Beacon. Uh, combinations of foods. This is something which you know, we know that we're supposed to eat good things. Uh, and stay away from bad things. But did we know that combining things can either improve the absorption of the nutrients or actually interfere with them? And I learned some things with some stories in this issue that I want to share. Give us some specifics. All right. Let's say carrots. Carrots are known for having beta carotene, really good antioxidants, yeah. good for your body. If you eat just the carrots straight, you're going to absorb one-sixth of what is available to you compared to what you'd eat if you had it with fat, if you have it with an avocado, if you have it with salad dressing. Just a little bit of fat in the body together with that carrot releases and allows the body to make use of the beta carotene. So the carrot salad and, and right. a mayonnaise is actually so little, better than a... Don't overdo the fat, okay, but I'm a little bit of fat. You know, this is, this is what I'm, I'm trying to give you <coughs> portions exactly. I like the avocado okay. thing. Broccoli. Broccoli is good cancer fighting, sulforaphanes, right. that kind of thing. Except Again, when President Bush didn't like it or something. Well, that's whatever, his problem. Whatever. Go ahead. <laughs> so what you can improve the absorption of that by combining it with spicy things like radishes or horseradish or cabbage. I don't know how they would combine, to, and honestly, in terms of food taste, but 
Anyway, that's what they discovered scientifically. This is now, so cool. Yeah. Now, iron, which is like iron fortified cereals, right? Iron needs some vitamin C to help it be absorbed. Okay. So they did a test. If, they, if you eat your cereal with banana or you eat your cereal with kiwi or <coughs> berries, and they find that you absorb a lot more of the iron with the kiwi or, or the berries, berries with vitamin C as opposed to the banana. So that's an interesting one. Uh, on the other Liver side. Liver and bananas. Liver, what delicious. Was that with iron? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think what's, what's full of iron. Yeah, go ahead, spinach. Calcium. We all know that calcium needs vitamin D to be absorbed. That's why our milk has vitamin mm -hmm. D in it, that kind of thing. And there are other ways of getting in calcium, like from dark leafy greens, uh, you know, kale and, and collard greens and things like that also have a lot of calcium. But what I learned which was new was if you eat your calcium, you drink your milk on wheat cereal, whole grain wheat cereal, which is what a lot of us do because we think we're being healthy, would you believe wheat? interferes with the absorption of calcium. <coughs> so if no, you, yes. say it's not so. So, so if, if your whole day's calcium is that milk you put on your cereal, you're losing it. It's not going to get into you because the wheat blocks the absorption. So who knew these things? But they're discovering more all the time. Mr. Kellogg, Mr. Post, <laughs> you've killed us. More, more, give us more. Okay, well, let's talk about a little travel stuff maybe. Yeah. I'd like that. Okay, we have an article. You know, we're all travelers. Yes, indeed. Yeah. So here's, this is an article really about, for, for older adults, for people who have sort of time to sort of decide where they want to go and when they want to go. If you, the, the author of the story says, if you know where you want to go and when you have to be there, you're not going to be able to negotiate or get much of a really good deal. But if you say, I want to go somewhere interesting, and I'm going to go somewhere around this time of whatever, and you can, then you can plug in, um, Google has something called Google Flights. You can plug in six different airports on the leaving end and six on the arrival end. So I want to go London, Paris, Lisbon, you know, Madrid. I'm going to leave from Philadelphia, Baltimore, or Washington. And it'll show you all the rates and what's cheapest. And you can sort of say, oh, OK, well, this time I'm going to Lisbon. You know, whatever. You can really find much better deals that way. And there, of course, there are newsletters and companies that specialize in finding these kind of deals. You can do it that way, too. But if you want to do it on your own, Google Flights is an interesting thing that you can try. So when you come on, I mean, I, we always feel so much more educated. Not that <laughs> for the rest of you guys as well, but this is fantastic. This is why I love my do. job. Just, right. just finding the stories that we want to put in the beacon every month. You know, I learn a lot of things I don't get in the beacon also, but, you know. So the prove. idea with the flights is that there's always a sale <coughs> for somewhere. Well, something's going to be cheaper than something else. Right. right. So if you're willing to go wherever, right. then. Oh, and by the way, don't wait to the last minute to get your flights. It used to be, right, that at the end, the last two, three weeks, if you were free to go, you could say, oh, well, give me what's left, and it'll be really cheap. That's not the way they do it anymore, because the airlines have discovered that the <coughs> business, business class people buy the last minute seats, and they pay huge amounts of money for those tickets. So they don't, they don't hold seats to the end or give away the seats to the end. They, they keep the prices really high. So you buy it earlier to get the better price. OK. More health issues. More health issues. OK. Um, osteoporosis. Um, we have I'm an article straight. called, called yeah, <laughs> uh, 10 Steps for um, Fighting Osteoporosis. And of course, there's, there's actually there's a lot of things that you will have known about. The, the thing about the cereal and the wheat was one of those aspects of that particular story as well. Sure. Um, can I talk about um, negotiating bills? Wait, wait, wait. Can you talk about negotiating bills? <laughs> uh, let's negotiate. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's so many different bills that we pay every month. There's the cell phone bill and the the internet and the cable and, and the storage locker, whatever it is. And as you know, there's all these competitions going on to try to steal clients from everybody else. So all the new companies are coming in and offering really great deals. But what do I do? I've been staying with this company for five years or 10 <coughs> years. I've been a loyal customer. And, and all of a sudden, everybody else is paying half of what I'm paying. So negotiate. Don't just let that go. Find out what the other people are offering that you might reasonably switch to. Then call up your carrier and say, look, this is what you're offering new people. This is what they're offering new people. I'm going to leave if you don't offer that to me or something like it. And they will, they will generally start negotiating. Doesn't that. And don't take the first offer. Do you think that left. would work with the Washington Post? I just got it my, does. I just got my just bill for one year subscription. $650, right? 675 Yeah, we just did I, that. I, I, my, I told my I wife when I saw that, I said, this is crazy. So what did you get? Three fifty. They cut it in half or something like that. Okay, I'm doing that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, we're going to follow that. Listen, there we go. No point in paying more than we need to. That's just not, not reasonable uh, That's our final consumerism, word. right? <laughs> not reasonable. You got, it was very reasonable talking to you all. What a great show. Thank you for joining me, and thank all of you in the viewing audience for joining us for this week's edition of Montgomery Week in Review. I'm Don Moores, inviting you to join us again next week at this very same time.